G'day, and welcome to the AHDC podcast series, Health Design on the Go. Today, we will be interviewing Sarah Holdsworth from RMIT University. We'd like to thank the 100% Project for allowing them to share their podcast with Sarah Holdsworth, who has a deep dive into the research about women in construction industry. Thank you to the 100% Project, and we take it over from there. Hi, I'm David Cummins from The 100% Project. In this series of podcasts, we'll be discussing gender diversity within the construction industry and how it has impacted the industry. We will also be investigating the steps necessary for making improvements for gender equality in the future. I'm talking today to Dr. Sarah Holdsworth from the School of Property, Construction and Project Management at RMIT University. Sarah is an Associate Professor of Sustainable Built Environments and has spent several years been researching women's experiences in the Victorian construction industry with the aim of better understanding how women gain entry and experience into the industry. The research seeks to provide an evidence base to inform policy and programs to increase the attraction and retention of women in all roles across the industry. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for your time. How are you today? I'm good. And thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to chat with you today and to speak to all your viewers about such an important issue that I and many others are so passionate about and hope to begin to or continue really creating change in the construction industry with regards to women and their experiences. Yeah, so speaking about that, a lot of the 100% project is actually based on evidence, which is one of our unique selling points. And I remember at university, I was always taught, what does the research say? But you've taken that one step further and you've actually done all the research yourself, which is very impressive. So what actually motivated you to get into the research of such a unknown topic in the construction industry? As you mentioned in your introduction, I've been working at RMIT for a number of years and I've been working in the School of Property Construction and Project Management and I've been lecturing to future construction managers and project managers. And a number of years ago, some colleagues and I sat down and really thought about how important it would be to better understand and prepare our students for the workplace they were going to enter upon the completion of their degree. And we thought this was really important as educators for us to give real consideration to because we know the construction industry presents not only physical workplace hazards, but also social hazards that can impact not only on physical well-being, but also its employees' mental well-being. So through a lens of resilience, we sought to understand how we could prepare our students to enter or transition into the industry based on how prepared they were as a result of the engagement around this notion of resilience that we were undertaking. Now, we thought resilience was an important aspect to really grapple with in the context of our students and their existing capabilities, because we know that individuals with high levels of resilience are able to manage stress and anxiety and bounce back from adverse circumstances with often heightened levels of capability. And we know that the construction industry is a workplace that can be characterised as high pressure, having a poor work-life balance, individuals having limited job control, low levels of managerial support, and one that is hyper-masculine. So we saw resilience as something that was really important for our students to have high levels in to enable them to best perform as they work their way through the industry. Now, the research that we undertook are focused on looking at our first years and our fourth years, how they transitioned in, how they moved across the degree program, and then also how they transitioned into that workplace. And one of the really great things about our program is the majority of our students are working by third and fourth year. So we were able to ascertain how prepared students were to negotiate some challenges and adversity as they were experiencing them in their degree, but also as that then translated out into their work workplace experience. And what we found was that as our students moved from their first year to their fourth year, as you would imagine, 
managing the stresses of university coupled with the balances of work and working in a construction industry or a construction landscape, their resilience increased. But one thing we did note, and we were quite surprised and maybe we shouldn't have been, was that our fourth year female students had a higher level of resilience than our male students did. And their level of mental health had also declined. And upon reflection, myself and my colleagues, Michelle Turner and Christina Scott-Young, really sought to gain a greater understanding and through some discussions and interviews with those students, you know, we recognise that as is the case with all minority groups, their health outcomes are worse despite experiencing the same levels of adversity than the majority of the population. And so as construction educators and researchers, we sought to look at ways in which we could really think through learning and teaching practice to address this kind of gender difference. There's obviously a high level of gender disparity in the industry, but also in our classrooms, because our classrooms are a microcosm of the industry. And as we slowly began to grapple with ways to think through dealing with conscious and unconscious bias in our learning and teaching practice, we recognised that we needed to think more than just about the resilience of the individual because this issue is, and when I say this issue, when I'm talking about health outcomes, dealing with adversity, it can't be on the individual. It can't be just the female student or the female graduate trying to address a conflicting workplace that has negative implications to their resilience or to their mental health or simply their workplace experience. So we sought to look beyond the idea of resilience and we embarked on a body of research that looked at how women going into professional roles in the construction industry experience the industry more broadly, not just their resilience, but, you know, what were the antecedents to a good workplace experience? What were the barriers? What were the opportunities? What was the workplace culture like? And then recognising that women in professional roles are a minority, but women in trades and semi-skilled roles are even less represented in the industry, we began to broaden out not necessarily the scope of the research, but the population within which we were researching. So last year, we were really fortunate to get some funding from the Victorian government to look at the barriers and the enablers of well-being for women working in trades and semi-skilled roles. And as you said earlier, David, to really form an evidence base from which we can develop or we can make recommendations, what recommendations we might make to government or industry or industry associations or women themselves around ways in which we can improve the experience of women working in the construction industry. And as you said, it's not just about attraction and recruitment, it's also about the retention of women because we want to see more women working in the industry. And as we get more women working in the industry, we can improve the way women experience the industry and that will in turn then encourage more women into the industry. And what we saw is so opportunistic and exciting from our perspective was the fact that we could talk to women based on their day-to-day experiences. So making recommendations, not from what we think sitting back in university or from what a male construction manager might have observed, but actually talking to women about their day-to-day experience, about the issues that they face, about the things that really work for them and make recommendations to support women based on the opportunities women have identified as informed by their experiences. That's an amazing introduction, to be honest. At the end of the day, I've been in the industry for 13 years and you're 100% right. If you don't identify what the problem is, you can't fix it. And I personally have seen gender diversity and sexism and abuse and bullying in the industry personally and also towards my female colleagues. And those females generally don't survive. And, you know, there are those people that stay. But if you can't identify what the problem is, You can't fix it. So what were some of the experiences that you're finding or the barriers that you're finding that really inhibited the fact that women didn't stay in the industry? Okay, so we can talk about this from two perspectives. We can talk about women as they are attracted into the industry and then what women experience as that informs their retention. Which would you like me to talk through first? I suppose it's an evolution, isn't it? Like you need to get them in first. What attracted me to the industry is that I like the complication of it and I like being outdoors and I like the team camaraderie I like the problem solving I don't think that's a male only desire to have that in the workplace so I think that would be an attraction but I I don't know 
So from the work that we've completed, talking with women who've graduated and are in a range of levels in professional roles, with women working in trades and semi-skilled roles, and more recently with women undertaking apprenticeships and traineeships, we began to explore through our research what attracts them and then what are the barriers to recruiting those women and then what does that mean in terms of their lived experience in terms of their retention and as you've suggested similar to yourself wanting to work in a high paced industry is something that attracts women to the industry a varied workplace really doing something tangible that contributes to society by way of a building or a piece of infrastructure that's going to contribute to the social capital of the communities within which they work but also an industry that is physical and also allows them to have a very tangible impact to perhaps their creative side or their problem solving side. So women are attracted to the industry as you've suggested, as you were, for the same reason. But in terms of engaging, it's one thing to be attracted to the industry. It's another thing to then be able to recruit. And from the work that we've undertaken, there still exists within the industry a very strong gendered stereotype that construction is work for men. And that kind of work is not appropriate it's not suitable or that women simply don't belong because they don't have the capabilities or because they just will be a disruption or they will be non-committed. So women are attracted to the industry for all the reasons that you suggested, but gaining entry to the industry is something that is particularly difficult for women because of this ongoing perception that the work is not for them. When you say not for them, are you talking about from a strength point of view, a mental point of view, a sex point of view? What do you actually mean by that? I'm in construction, but I've never lifted anything and I don't drive trucks, but I'm still in the industry. What do you mean by they don't have the capability? Obviously, just recognising I am simply reporting what I have have heard. So a lot of the women that I've spoken to have been told flat out that women can't do a man's job because they don't have the physical strength or to lift heavy pieces of wood. So not for them from a physicality point of view. And of course, I'm not talking about everybody in the industry, but from the women we've spoken with, there has been a distinct narrative that questions their physical ability to undertake the tasks. Then, as you pointed out, there's also the issue that emotionally they won't be able to cope with an industry that's high pressure or an industry that can be quite conflicting. You know, some harsh words can be spoken. It can be quite abrasive. So there's also concern that women don't have the emotional capabilities to manage in the harsh landscape. And I'll give you a really good example of that. I was speaking with an apprentice a few weeks ago and she described going for a job to make sure she was able to undertake her apprenticeship. And she had multiple interviews with her now employer who was not necessarily concerned about her capability because this woman had family members that had worked in the industry and ran their own businesses. And in the end, the apprentice offered to invite a family member to come to one of the interviews and the whole interview with the family member was about whether or not this particular person had the social and the emotional abilities to cope with the industry. So a a third person who was male had to come to give the potential employer enough courage to put this particular individual into that position. There's also a concern that women will not be committed or not present because we know the nature of the industry is contract. We do shift work, seven days a week, long hours, and it's fine to be young and single. But as soon as you come to the age of thinking about having a family, whether you're in a management position or in a trade or a semi-skilled role, questions arise from the women I've spoken to about whether or not women as employees will be committed. 
why spend all this time training when they're just going to go off and have a family and leave the industry? And that's then also perpetuated by a lack of experience dealing with pregnancy in the industry. So people don't know how to manage a pregnant tradeswoman and she shouldn't be managed. But what work do we give a pregnant woman who's doing reasonably dangerous work at height or so on? Do we have maternity clothes? How do we manage women in apprenticeships and in TAFE? What do we do with women in terms of maintaining their abilities to continue studying and accruing the days that are required to successfully complete an apprenticeship? And what does that then mean for returning to work? And how do we manage those hours with young children and family? And there's this assumption that women with kids will need to take days off when the kids get sick and so on. So there's these issues associated with gender that women kind of grapple more with than men. And that is a question mark that poses a risk in which not all employees are prepared to pursue. I would say in the construction industry, when I've had females on site, the site runs smoother, the aggression is less. There are tremendous benefits to having more women on site. And if people want to say men are generally more stronger than women, But I would say women are also more generally organised than men and probably have a stronger emotional intelligence than men in the sense that I've been on site many a time where I've seen pushes and fights and had still pipes thrown at my head. But that level of aggression and lack of emotional intelligence, it's not acceptable in any industry. And just because it's a construction industry doesn't mean it's accepted there and it shouldn't be accepted there. So I would say as a, I'm not an employer, but as a potential employer, the benefits outweigh the negatives. What is some of the benefits that your research has uncovered, which will no doubt lead to future policies? From the women that we've spoken to, they have articulated the fact that once they're able to prove themselves, once they're able to show that they A, have the capability and B, that they are committed and C, that they're motivated and they love their job, they then become welcomed. Um, And that's not in every case. There are some incredibly supportive workplaces out there and there are some women that have had amazing experiences, but there are a lot that have encountered problems. But they all identify the women. I've spoken with TAFE educators and employers. There's a recognition that once women are given the opportunity, they're able to show that they have problem-solving skills. They are able to bring a level of attention to detail that means the quality of their work is really high. They are able to focus on tasks and multitask all at the same time and they do bring a different dynamic to the workplace. But I think it's important to recognise that we shouldn't be employing women to change the culture of the industry. There is a value add that once they're embraced because they've had to prove themselves to be accepted, there is absolutely a recognised benefit. A lot of the women that I've spoken to have talked about the fact that they feel a level of pressure to prove to their employers that women can do it. And when they do, they see their employers employing more women because they've seen that women are as capable as men are. There's benefits to having men on site. There's benefits of having women on site. But the difference is women don't necessarily get the opportunity to show what they're capable of doing. And to your point about lifting heavy objects and so on, we have an Occupational Health and Safety Act, and that regulates that nobody should be lifting certain weights. Nobody should be working certain hours. Everybody has the right to work in a safe workplace. And from a physicality perspective, everybody should be able to do the same tasks as each other, regardless of their gender. And while we're talking about that, not all men are super strong. There are some women that are much stronger than some men. And just because you're a man, should you be lifting really heavy objects? Because that's physically not good for you or your body in the long term either. You're 100% right. I was on one site once and these two 19-year-olds they were pushing plasterboard. And I think the oh and rule was you're allowed to have five per cart, had 20. Yeah, long story short, it came out of the alley Mac and crushed his leg and he broke his leg. Just silly stuff like that. And then I was on another site where it was five, took longer, but that was what the rules were and it took longer and he didn't crash his leg and it worked fine. So you're 100% right. There are rules in place and if people want to cut corners, well, they'll get caught eventually. So 
I do think there are tremendous benefits in, in having that as well. How important do you think leadership is where decision makers are educated about the importance of women in the workplace in the construction industry? I think leadership is really important and I think leadership needs to come from all levels of site. I don't think leadership just sits with upper level management. Leadership needs to be shown by all stakeholders working on site but also working around site. So all stakeholders associated with the construction industry need to be part of making changes that crush this gendered stereotype. So with the research that we undertook last year, where we interviewed 43 women working in trades and semi-skilled work, we identified that a lot of the women that were working on site found that they were not supported. And a lack of support was exhibited from management, from colleagues, from all different stakeholders out on site. So We need leadership in terms of, you know, people need to take on the responsibility to lead by their behaviours. So we need all people working on site to recognise inappropriate behaviours when it occurs. So when women and men are experiencing inappropriate verbal behaviours or inappropriate physical behaviours. We need people to call it out because one thing that we found was one of the key barriers that had a really negative impact on women and the way in which they experienced inappropriate behaviours out on site was this culture of silence and that often when inappropriate behaviours were occurring, people of all levels just turned a blind eye. And so there was a real reporting from the women we spoke to of a culture of silence out on site. So people failed to call out inappropriate workplace banter. They failed to call out communication that was overtly aggressive. They failed to call out inappropriate behaviours. And as a consequence, women continued to be marginalised and experienced feelings of isolation, being ostracised, being belittled, being excluded and fearing for their own safety and also opportunities. So I think leadership in terms of speaking out when you see something that's not right is super important. But coming back to the point about management, I'll never forget this story a woman I spoke to recalled. She told me that she was on site and she was in a meeting with some workers from the site and a junior construction manager. She was completely inappropriately spoken to and the meeting ended and she went about her task and she said maybe 40 minutes later that assistant construction manager came back to her and apologised for the way that she'd been spoken to and he apologised on behalf of the employee. It wasn't his employee, it was a subby, but apologised on behalf of the person, said it was inexcusable and he felt really bad. And she said to me that while she appreciated the apology, what really upset her was the fact that he didn't say anything as it was occurring. And my response to her was, well, would it have made a big difference? And she said unequivocally, absolutely. If he had called out that behaviour, it would have ceased and it wouldn't have occurred again. So it's really important that we lead by our behaviours. We treat people with respect and in a way that they deserve to be treated in a workplace, but also as a person, but that we don't ignore it when we see it. We call it out and we really live that practice so that the industry slowly evolves in terms of what is acceptable normalised behaviour. Because at the moment, a lot of women and men as well deal with unacceptable behaviours because it's just considered the norm. And nobody says anything. And women, when they do speak out about it, recalled often being punished. So even though they're not perpetrating that behaviour, they're experiencing that behaviour, they get punished. And women talk about fear of repercussions. And the repercussions that I've heard might be being stood down. If they're in casual work, they go to the bottom of the list and they've got to wait till they get the top of the list to be called for shifts. And they might be put back in the yard and not given work for a couple of weeks. They might become 
labelled and so they get a reputation as they move around job sites because, you know, in the industry we never stay on the same site. We're moving around jobs consistently. So as they move around, they get labelled as being a troublemaker, being difficult. And if, you know, you are one in 1,300 workers who is female, it's pretty obvious who you are. So you get labelled and you're already feeling isolated enough and then to have this label where people deliberately don't talk to you because you're perceived as trouble or talk to her, you'll get told off or you'll get in trouble. So policies and procedures for reporting inappropriate behaviours, showing leadership by establishing those policies is really important, but contributing to that change in culture of what is normalised and allowing people to freely speak up about incidences that have occurred without fear and without being persecuted and then actually having some repercussions to those that have been exhibiting those behaviours. Because again, the women that we've spoken to often found that not only were they punished, but the person that took that behaviour, there were no consequences. And that could happen across all levels and positions on site. So it could have been a senior manager. It could have been someone that's just come on the site for a day as part of a labour hire. Yeah, and one of the problems that you've highlighted there is that was obviously an open meeting, but there's also the closed corridor conversations that are behind closed doors where people think, as Trump would say, locker room conversations where people think they're not being listened to. And I was on a site once where one of the managers and subbies were talking about females but didn't realise the barrier was not acoustically protected and the female was next door and heard everything. It was reported to me, I was there, caught out the guys and they were thrown off site straight away because it's just not acceptable behavior. So on many levels, there's those discussions happening behind closed doors and in open doors. To your point about this locker room interaction, I guess that's another issue or another way of men communicating that women have identified that isolates them is that a lot of the time men talk in their social clique, which women aren't included in. So it might not even be anything derogative. It just could be the fact that you've got a group of men on site that are all talking footy and because you've got a female worker there she won't be interested in footy so she's not included or they go out to the pub for lunch and she's not invited or they go on their golf days on the weekends away and she's not included so it doesn't have to be something that is overtly offensive it can simply be women are excluded from those social interactions and that's really important because When you're excluded like that, you don't make the connections that you need to progress the kind of work that you're undertaking. So a lot of promotions, a lot of job opportunities all come about through word of mouth, especially in the construction industry. Everybody knows somebody who knows somebody. And if you're not included in those conversations, you don't have the rapport or you don't have access to the opportunities in terms of different kinds of work or leadership positions. And invariably, a lot of the women that we spoke to, one of the things that they really want, aside from a workplace where they feel safe, is a workplace where they're giving meaningful work tasks. And part of meaningful work tasks is being given the opportunity to do all the kinds of work that men do. And some of these jobs are quite coveted, so you need to be kind of in the in crowd to access but also that if you want to take on a leadership role you need to have the ear of the people that you're working with and in some instances women explain to us that even though they were identified as the best candidate for a leadership position because and this you know quote unquote because the boys won't take orders from a woman or from a girl (laughs) she wasn't given that leadership responsibility or some women reported managers giving them lots of support and opportunities to go and do additional training and get additional skills. But because the work colleagues wouldn't allow her to undertake those tasks, you've got an issue in that you've got women being educated and upskilled, but not then able to pursue the jobs associated with those skills. And therefore you've got an educated, but maybe not experienced workforce as well. Just before we finish up, your research is basically allowing to help create policy for the future. So what is that policy looking like at the moment? What do you think we can do to help? And what does society have to do to help overcome some of these issues? Some of the recommendations that we made were really about a systems approach, because as I said, it can't be the individual and it can't be women trying to create change themselves. We need to have a systems approach where 
all stakeholders in the industry assume a level of responsibility for changing the way in which women are perceived and afforded opportunities. And I think for me, one of the really important things is this zero tolerance of inappropriate behaviour. And inappropriate behaviour towards women, because as I said before, as a minority group, these things tend to exacerbate. But in general, people say to me all the time, we've employed a woman and she wants to be treated the same. So we treat her the same and then she gets really upset. And it's like, what are the behaviours that we accept as normal? And are they really acceptable? Would I be able to behave like that in my workplace and maintain my job? No. So it's not that it's the woman's fault. It's we need to recognise what appropriate behaviour could and should look like. It's about adopting procurement practices where we require gender equality and opportunity in the workplace. So it's not just about saying, okay, well, we've employed this percentage of women on site and then we put them all on the same task. We've got them all in traffic management or they're all sweeping with a broom. We want to have women doing all tasks, whether that's management positions, trade positions, semi-skills, and we want them of all stages of their career. So we want to have apprentices. We want to have trainees. We want to have just qualified. We want senior managers. We want assistant contract admin. We want women in all positions. We want access to quality of employment and this idea that women of all stages of their lives are being able to access. Because one thing we found that was as soon as women started to consider a family, the idea was, well, we'll keep working in the commercial sector perhaps that we're in and then when our children are a little bit older and we're ready to come back to work, we'll start our own business. Now, that's great if you're a tradeswoman, but if you're not a tradeswoman, what work practices do you go back to? So flexible hours, flexibility in the workplace and just a recognition that we need to create safe workspaces under our Occupational Health and Safety Act and that's not just physical. We need to have primary intervention measures that reduce or remove the psychosocial risk as well as the physical risk. And I think the other thing that's really important is we need to communicate the opportunities to women of all ages as well because the majority of the research that I've undertaken so far really identifies that the majority of women coming into the construction industry as an apprentice or as a semi-skilled worker often as a second career choice. Now, sometimes that's because these women thought trades might be good for them as a schoolgirl but were told that it wouldn't be suitable because the culture wouldn't be suitable or the opportunities wouldn't be there. So you've got a lot of tradeswomen coming in as a mature age apprentice because it was discussed that it wouldn't necessarily be the right fit. Or as a schoolgirl, you don't know what the opportunities are within the construction industry. And we have a lot of mature age women coming in as a second career into semi-skilled roles looking for opportunities in the industry and helping identify those pathways into a variety of roles that exist. So really showing women what they can be at all stages of their lives, but also showing what they can be because at the moment, the diversity of opportunity is not well communicated for people to see, to then enter and then be retained. Thank you for your time today, Dr. Sarah. We really appreciate it. Do you have any take-home messages for our listeners today? Thank you, David, for the opportunity today. And what I would just like to say on a more positive note is that the industry is slowly changing. There are more women coming into the construction industry. And I think there are a lot of people doing a lot of work out there to try and ensure we slowly, slowly grow the numbers of women across all roles in the construction industry. Progress is being made, but there's always plenty of opportunities for improvement. And I look forward to the day when I see many, many, many more women working in all roles in the construction industry as I drive or walk past construction sites. Thank you very much. If you would like to find out more about The 100% Project, our research, and listen to other podcasts, please visit our website, the100percentproject.com.au. Thank you for listening.